All right, we are going to get started here tonight, Genesis chapter 9. And uh, in this chapter, we are going to come into some challenging questions tonight. I am kind of curious to see what you think of it here when we're done. Just a real quick review because it's going to tie into this week. Uh, We did talk about in Genesis 8, uh, some of the comparisons or uh, I guess the patterns that are being followed from creation to the flood. Not a unique thing in scripture. We talked about how Noah opening the window was kind of like the first day of creation separating light and darkness. The rain stopping from above and below was just like day two where God separates the waters above and below. Dry ground appearing in Noah's ark was like dry ground appearing on day three. Uh, the sun, moon, and stars perhaps being where you know Noah could see that because he's going to open the windows. He sends out a raven and a dove, two birds, just like on day five, birds are created. And then the animals are let out to fill the earth just as day six, man and animals were created to fill the earth. Then we also see right after that a command to be fruitful and multiply. And then after that, the seventh day of creation, a day of rest, we see Noah, there's a covenant established with him, and Noah meaning rest. So taking all of those things, that's kind of one layer of it. But you can peel one layer of that onion back, and you can even see even smaller details, where we're going to see that both Noah and Adam were told to subdue the earth. In essence, to have dominion over it. You're going to see that both of them are going to have a covenant, a promise made. Okay, With Noah's case, it's the rainbow. In Adam's case, it's going to ultimately be that uh, there would be an offspring that would redeem. We're going to see that in both cases, there is a ground that is cursed. You're going to see that in both cases, right afterwards, there will be a sacrifice being made as we continue through this Genesis. Um, You can kind of see I have the chapters there. Chapter 2 for the the subduing the earth and the covenant. Chapter 3 for the ground curse. Chapter 4, there's a sacrifice that Cain and Abel make. Abel specifically. We're going to see Noah gets off the ark here in chapter 9 and is going to make a sacrifice. We're going to see that there is a curse that takes place um, because Cain um, kills his brother, ultimately he is cursed. Likewise, we're going to see in this chapter, because Ham is going to do some evil deed, that there will be a curse that will come upon him and his children. You will see then right after that a division of two groups. In chapter 4 of Genesis, we see it follows the line of Cain and it follows the line of Seth, dividing two separate people, one following God, one not following God. You're going to see the same thing here in Genesis 9, that there's going to be a separation of people, one following God, one not following God. The line of Ham will become enemies of Israel. Right after that, in chapter 5, we have a genealogy that is being given, the genealogy of uh, Seth in the genealogy of Canaan, or Lamech, I mean. In chapter 10, we're going to see right after this, we're going to see a genealogy, a great list of uh, people. And then we're going to see problems arise right after the genealogy. In chapter 6, we see the Nephilim and the violence that are covering the earth. In chapter 11, you're going to see Babel, and basically worshiping um, some Probably, you know, false gods there at Babel. Would you say Abel's the sacrifice, or would you say... The- not, not Abel was, the, but he was making offerings in a sense. Oh, I got you. Yeah, I got you. yeah. So, um, a lot of different parallels. We can take and peel off one more layer. We can see that the, the world became wicked in Genesis 3. And it just gets worse and worse and worse, of course. But right out of the box, the world was wicked. Right from the beginning. Likewise, Noah gets off the ark, and we're going to see wickedness almost immediately with Ham. It doesn't take long for the human nature to rear its ugly head. You will see that the 
door of the ark was a picture really of Jesus and Jesus coming and bringing salvation. He says, come to me. There was only one way to be saved. That's to go through the door into the ark. There's only one way in the New Testament for you to be saved, to go through the door of Jesus to be saved. And so bringing this up to the New Testament, we see this wicked world. When Jesus came, the world was wicked. Really, they had all but forgotten about him. We're living life pretty well independently. And they didn't recognize him when he comes. So... He's going to have to prepare an ark, in essence. That would be himself, Jesus, the door of salvation. We're going to see that the ark brings a baptism of the earth. Again, that's what Scripture says, not my words, in 1 Corinthians 10, I believe. Well, what does Jesus do when he comes? The first thing he does is there's a baptism that he will undergo. You will see that they subdue. Noah is given a command to subdue the earth. So Adam was given that same command. Well, Jesus, what does he go and do? In his mission, as his call goes out, he goes to subdue and put everything under his authority and dominion. We'll talk about that later, but in essence, everything that Israel was supposed to do and fails, Christ does and succeeds. You're going to see that right after he's told to subdue, there's a covenant made with them. What does Jesus do after he shows his authority and dominion? There is a covenant that is made ultimately on the cross, a covenant that is fulfilled. We see as well that there is a curse made after that covenant. I was going to put this verse up there, but I forgot to do it. But we always are very you know, aware of John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever should believe in him should not perish but have eternal life, right? But... Read verse 17. He who does not believe stands condemned already. There is a curse that goes along with it for those who do not accept that covenant. We then see a division, as I was saying, a division into two groups, Cain and Seth, um, Ham and Shem, or the sheep and the goats, Jews and Gentiles. Not to say that all of either of those are sheep or goats, but just those separation of two groups. We also see um, a genealogy is given after that, like I said. Ultimately, we become that genealogy. Because of Christ, we now have become a priesthood of believers. That we become the genealogy of priests, the genealogy of God followers. And then soon after problems arise, like I said, and what we see in the New Testament is soon after all of this. It doesn't take but a couple of chapters after Jesus ascends to heaven that we see persecution beginning and the church is scattered. Just like at Babel, just like Cain had to spread out and he could, you know, would be a wanderer. The Tower of Babel makes people wanderers. We see persecution makes the church scatter and fill the earth. So there are all these parallels in many different ways that we can look at. And I just want you to recognize that as we go through this chapter a little bit. So let's begin. Verse 1, Then God blessed Noah and his son, saying to them, Be fruitful and increase in number, and fill the earth. The fear and dread of you will fall upon all the beasts of the earth and all the birds of the air upon every creature that moves along the ground and upon all the fish of the sea, they are given into your hands. So, it's almost as if we're starting all over again, except this time with Noah and his family rather than Adam and Eve. This time in not such a so perfect world. Just as Adam, as I said, was blessed and told be fruitful and increase in number, we see the same thing here. Just as he was told to subdue the earth in Genesis 1.28, Here we see everything is given into your hands. You are to subdue it. You are to work it. So all of these parallels right in the very first verses. Another thing is, one of the things I listened to, I don't remember who it was, but uh, Tara could probably tell me because she heard it too. Uh, Oh, I know what it was, but anyway. um, We were talking about subduing and having dominion over the creation. 
When God told Adam to do that, in essence, what he was saying is, you are to take over the curse. You are to rule over it. You are to have dominion over this earth. And so, in naming the animals, Adam is subduing, showing his authority over it. And I got got to thinking about that a little bit, and I thought, well, you know, it's kind of neat that there are so many mundane jobs that we do on a day-to-day basis, especially women. I mean... Washing dishes day after day after day, cleaning the cupboards or the countertops, or you know, dressing your kids, or whatever the case might be, something that we do over and over and over, constant, and it just gets like, why do I have to sweep the floor all the time? I remember sitting in India on the on a deck thing, looking down, watching people sweep their dirt floors, and I just thought, what a waste of time. But it kind of struck me that when we do these daily mundane things, we are obeying the command to create order out of chaos. That we are overcoming and subduing the the curse. I mean, the whole reason you have to comb your hair every day, most of us, right, Aaron, most of us, not... uh, The whole reason that we have to comb our hair every day is because everything falls apart. It is a result of the curse. But every time we even comb our hair, we are living out the command to subdue. I thought that was kind of neat to to put in perspective some of these daily drudgery that we go through. To put it in that perspective of, you know what, I'm serving God. I'm, I'm... I'm subduing. I'm I'm taking chaos and putting order into it. I also find it interesting that the animals were no longer going to be tame, it seems, at this point. We don't know what everything was like before the flood, but we do know that when Adam was created, the animals weren't mean. He could have, you know, gone up to T-Rex and flossed his teeth, played around with on him with the ground, done whatever, you know. There is no indication that any of that changed at the time of the fall. The only indication we see where there was a change in the attitude and personality of the animal is here when Noah gets off the ark. At this point, he says, now the fear and dread of you will fall upon all the beasts of the earth and the birds of the air. It it almost indicates that before Noah's flood, even after the fall, you probably could have still maybe gone up to T-Rex and given him a good, you know, pet. You know, hopped on the back of Pterodactyl for a a little joyride around around Eden. I don't know. It's speculation, but nonetheless, the Bible does say that this is the time that fear and dread will come upon you. Isn't it interesting that that's the way animals are today? I mean, that's living proof of the accuracy of Scripture. You don't just go walk up to a wild animal. They run off. Or if threatened, they'll attack. They're afraid of you. It's innate in them to be afraid of man. Why? There's no reason. They just are. Did they eat animals before the ark? To our knowledge, they maybe did, but doubtful, because they're not given permission to until you're going to see coming up here. So we were not given permission to eat meat until Noah gets off the ark. So therefore, it probably didn't. Now, does that mean that maybe some ungodly people were eating it? Possibly. But we don't know. So... It's kind of interesting that if they were tame, you probably, I mean, it's not like you're going to go walk up to your cat and, you know, strangle it for your next meal. Moving on to verse 3. Everything that lives and moves will be food for you. Right here, everything. Notice that word. Everything that lives and moves will be food for you. Just as I gave you the green plants, I now give you everything. You must not eat meat that has its lifeblood still in it, and for your lifeblood I will surely demand an accounting. I will demand an accounting from every animal and from each man too. I will demand an accounting for the life of his fellow man, 
Whoever sheds the, sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God has God made man. So this being everything, that we could eat everything that moves will be food for you, just as I gave you the green plants. A lot of people see us, say, well, see, here in Genesis, that means you could eat anything you wanted. However, it doesn't necessarily mean that way or look that way because that would then contradict all of the commands that we see later and even the lifestyle of the Jews and, you know, uh, what Jesus himself taught, what the disciples did. So that must mean that there's got to be another explanation that everything doesn't necessarily always mean everything. And we see some examples of this in the New Testament as well because um, in Romans talking about food, all food being clean or whatever, we have to understand that what is food? Now, when we have our little potlucks, do I have to tell everybody, hey, guys, do not bring rat. Okay, I don't want you bringing barbecued rat to barbecue. All right, it's just not, I don't want to eat that. Okay, we, we don't want you to bring, you know, snake or whatever. There are certain things that we don't consider food. If I say food to you, a rat doesn't even come to mind. That's not food. And so when he's talking about food, the context here is things with blood in it, animals, meat versus plants. Just as I gave you plants, now I give you meat. Why weren't they eating meat before? Well, because when God created the world, there was no death. And so you're not going to kill animals to eat them because there can be no death. Now he is saying, I give you permission to eat meat. And so all food. But you say, well, how would they know what was clean and what wasn't clean to eat? I mean, what is mouse food just like because it's our culture not only did they know what was clean and unclean before because God says take five extra clean animals we also see some indications of that with Cain and Abel people today focus in on this everything rather than the context of meat versus plants and having life blood in order for this to say that you could eat pig, as an example, would mean then that all of these other rules and laws that come after this, even in the Old Testament, would be unbiblical and wrong to say you can't eat a pig. I've been showing you time and time and time again that all of the laws of Leviticus were known before Leviticus ever comes to be. I've shown you many examples. You'll see many more as we go through. That there is a law that they understood. It just wasn't written down. The rules were not put on the refrigerator. The rules were in their heart. How they understood the difference between clean and unclean, the Bible doesn't tell us. But the Bible does tell us they knew. And so you have to kind of keep that in mind as you look at this everything. I think it's all food is clean, meaning all, you know, clean, uh, uh, I should say all meat. All clean meat is okay to eat, just as all clean plants are good to eat. Because do you think that before this you were able to eat every green plant? Do you think that there would have been, since this is after the fall, some thorns and thistles and... Um, maybe poisonous types of plants because it's referring to every food that walks, every plant. I don't think they were eating every plant. I get why people would say this because it says everything that lives and moves. However, again, to keep consistency, you're either going to become uh, schizophrenic with the rest of Scripture and Jesus or... What he's talking about is food, actual food that has blood in it and is clean. 
Because like I said, they know the difference between clean and unclean. So I think he's saying every clean thing. It's just they didn't put the word clean in there. Didn't need to because it was common knowledge. There are dozens of things that they're doing that are in the book of Leviticus and they're doing it before it's even given in Leviticus. How did they know? God must have told them. For the life of a creature is in its blood. We've kind of talked about this before, but just to remind you that it says this in Leviticus 17.11, why you're not to eat things with life blood in it. <clears throat> the life of a creature is in the blood, and I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. Scripture says that the life of a creature... We talked about this before. The nephesh is the Hebrew word. Same exact word for soul. Your soul is in your blood. Your life is in your blood. Thus, your life is your soul. And animals have life. They have a soul. They have a nephesh. What makes us different than animals was, as I mentioned when we looked at it weeks ago, is a spiritual nature that God personally breathed into you. We talked about it on the first days of creation, how there was something new that had to be brought into existence on the sixth day of creation. He could already make man. There was even life for that man because life was created on day five, but something new had to be brought into existence on day six. So a difference there, just to remind you. But part of this then deals with the continuation that Not only was man going to be held accountable for his actions, but so are animals. Now, there's a couple of things in there, here in verse 5. Notice that he's saying a rule that, by the way, is in Exodus and Leviticus before the rule was there. In Exodus, it says this in chapter 21, verse 28. If a bull gores a man or a woman to death, the bull must be stoned to death. So why are we seeing this law before the law is given? Well, one reason is because what's changed in animals? They're now afraid of man. They're now going to fight against you if you get too close. They're not going to be tame. And so now with this comes a consequence that if that animal goes after my created people, my image, then they pay. And I think God has innately put that in an animal for the most part. That's why when an animal kills somebody, it's supposed to be put down. If a dog is biting, it should be put down. I don't care how much you love it. It should be put down. And that's biblical. What we're seeing happening here is God establishing for the first time a form of government. And we'll continue to see that as we move through Genesis. Another thing is is that Adam and Noah were both saved by faith in God. Really, faith in even the coming Messiah that Adam was promised was coming. Likewise, we too are saved in the same way by our faith in God and the Messiah that has come and is coming again. The rules of salvation before Leviticus are the same rules of salvation for us today. Abraham was saved by faith. And therefore, these Noahic commands, these commands given to Noah, I believe are also very applicable and fitting for us today, too. A lot of times people like to take God's covenants and say, well, this is the Abrahamic covenant. This is the Noahic covenant. This is the the Levitical covenant. This is the that covenant. This is... And we like to dice it up so that it's only for them. Only for Noah. Only for Adam. Only for for Abraham. No. 
This is one big plan of salvation that God had before the creation of the world. And the commands are not for a specific group of people among His people. They are for all of us. And therefore the promises as well as the commands given to Noah, given to Adam, given in Leviticus, given in the New Testament, are for you. Some will say that's only for the Jews, only for Israel. Well, I firmly believe you are Israel. Amen. You have been brought into that. Romans is so clear about that. To deny it, you have to be thinking because of some other theological doctrine your church has lied to you about, not because of the Bible. And so the rules are the same. Go back and listen I think it was when we went through the book of Esther, our uh, message on dual covenant theology. There's a covenant for the Jews and a covenant for the, the church today. That is not true, biblically. So anyway, the point being is that take this personally. Verse 7, As for you, be fruitful and increase in number. Multiply on the earth, just like we see with Adam. Increase upon it. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, I now establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you. So this covenant, this promise, is for you. With every living creature that was with you, the birds, the livestock, the wild animals, all those that came out of the ark, with you. Every living creature on earth. I establish my covenant with you. Never again will all life be cut off by the waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. So from eight people that are getting off the ark here, we now have over eight billion people on earth today. And we are being told that the world is overpopulated and, you know, we can't handle any more. So we need to kill most of us. At least that's what the globalist and the World Economic Forum and all of those people believe. 95% uh, decline in population would be ideal. Ted Turner said that, among others. I could give you quote after quote after quote. That is not being fruitful and multiplying. That is not believing in the promises that God says never again and that I will provide and take care of you. God made a covenant with all people, all animals, forever. All the people to come. And now, the main part of that covenant is that he's not going to send a flood again. That it's going to destroy all life like that. Never going to destroy um, all life with water. A lot of times we have people today in the churches, as I said, believing in a local flood, but deny Noah's flood. If this was a local flood, killing all the animals in a general area, they would say, then God is a liar because we have had plenty of other glow, uh, big floods like Hurricane Katrina, uh, the tsunami in the Indian Ocean, other hurricanes that have killed, you know, that one in the Indian Ocean, what was it, 300,000 people killed? That's pretty major. So that would make God a liar in him not being faithful to a covenant here. This has to be a global flood, and he's saying, I'm never going to do that again. Truly all life being cut off. But with that said, as we've mentioned before, a day is coming when the earth is going to be destroyed forever, and a new earth is going to be put in its place, or at least this one is going to be restored somehow. Now, I don't think at this time when the earth is going to be destroyed, we need to worry about anything because I think at that time we'll be with the Lord. But point is, I think ultimately he is going to restore earth to what it was before the fall, before the curse, because the curse is going to be removed. And there's all kinds of verses that would talk about that. Revelation 21.1, 2 Peter 3.13, Isaiah 65, verse 17, Isaiah 66, verse 22, all promising of that. So you can be assured that uh, no flood is going to wipe out all mankind. Verse 12. God said, This is the sign of the covenant I am making between you, or between me and you, and every living thing with you, creature with you. 
a covenant for all generations to come. I have set my rainbow in the clouds, and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Whenever I bring clouds over the earth and the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will remember my covenant between me and you and all living creatures of every kind. Never again will the waters become a flood to destroy all life. Whenever the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and all living creatures of every kind on the earth. So God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant I have established between me and all life on the earth. Very repetitive. And when you see that repetition, it means you can count on it. The other thing that I find interesting here is that this rainbow appearing in the clouds, it's a covenant not just for the people, but to the animals, to all the living creatures as well. Some other details regarding this covenant. It is going to be repeated over and over and over. And this promise on God's part means it's not man's responsibility. It's not man who has control over it. Look what it keeps saying. My covenant that I am making. My covenant I make. Man has nothing to do. You know how there's usually two parties to a covenant? There isn't two parties to this covenant at all. Just one. It seems that according to Genesis 2.5, there was no rain on the earth until Noah's flood. That's kind of the way I believe or the way I see it, which explains why there would not be a rainbow until now. If this was the first time rain came, first time you'd see a rainbow. Now, once the rain comes, the rainbow appears, we're going to see in Scripture that it is only going to be seen three other times outside of these verses in Genesis, the rainbow. And every time, all three of those, it will be in God's presence. You see it in Ezekiel 1.28, Revelation 4.3, and Revelation 10.1. So anyway, this rainbow being in God's presence, I like that because I like the way that verse 15 says this, I will remember my covenant. Remember what I've been saying about remember? Anytime you see that word remember being used, it involves some sort of action on God's part. When God remembered Noah, when God remembered he then, it's not like he forgot, but it was like, I used that example of like my, I remember it's my wife's birthday on Saturday. I didn't forget, but I moved to action to buy her a gift. And so every time that rainbow appears, you can be assured that God, because he says, I will remember every time it appears, that God is moving into action in some way. We may not know what it is. We may not even be able to you know, see. But biblically speaking, God is doing something. He is fighting on your behalf. He is reminding you as well that you can trust Him and that He's got this because He is a man of action. I kind of like that. To be reminded that rather when we see a rainbow, just think, oh, that's so cool, that's all pretty. Remember, God's fighting for you. This is a promise. It's not just pretty. And to internalize this idea that God is remembering, and with it around his throne, it's always there around him meaning he is always fighting for you. That covenant is always being offered to you. Just some things to think about there. And again, this is all his faithfulness, not yours. Um, maybe not having clouds before 
the earth. I mentioned yeah. it before, high and low air pressure systems. If there was a canopy, it would not allow high and low air pressure systems, which means you would not have clouds before Noah's flood. No way of knowing for sure, just a scientific possibility to kind of throw that out. But again, this is for all generations. Verse 18, the sons of Noah who came out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. These were the three sons of Noah, and from them came the people who were scattered over the earth. So the entire world's population today, all eight billion of them, come from these three men. I've mentioned it before, just to remind you again, in our museum, we kind of show you there's a book out there, Traced, I think it's called. Anyway, genetics, because of what we know about genetics today and DNA, we have shown beyond a shadow of a doubt all people come from three lines. And it all traces back to about 4,500 years ago. Stops right there. Again, science, DNA, lines up with exactly what Scripture says. When you, you trace the, the Y chromosome. Ham being fathered, uh, the father of Canaan is important because it's mentioned here to show that Ham is going to be the father of those who are going to fight against the Israelites. Okay, It doesn't say, well, Shem was the father of this, or Japheth was the father, but it takes special note right now to say Ham is the father of Canaan because the Canaanites are going to be enemies of Israel. And it, it's not theirs. The, the promised land is not going to be theirs. Uh, take, take note of this. I think part of the reason it's doing is because the Canaanites are going to be the ones that want to claim the right and authority to that land. And God is going to say, no, that's not your land. Okay, but note the claiming authority. That's going to be important here coming up in these next verses. So, verse 20, Noah, a man of the soil, proceeded to plant a vineyard. When he drank some of its wine, he became drunk and he lay uncovered inside his tent. Ham, the father of Canaan, saw his father's nakedness and told his two brothers outside. Now, by the way, Canaan isn't born yet. It doesn't seem. But Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it across their shoulders, and they walked in backward and covered their father's nakedness. Their faces were turned to the other way so that they would not see their father's nakedness. By the way, another parallel here. After the Garden of Eden, what did we see? We see fruit, right? Uh, being involved, and then we see nakedness coming from that. Here we see uh, planting a vineyard, fruit, and nakedness following that same pattern that we see. And then after that, a covering of the nakedness. So, again, these patterns are everywhere. Uh, again, this is kind of the chiastic structure of Scripture that we've talked about many times. There are really three different ideas as far as what's going on here. Um, what's interesting, I'm going to jump ahead just a little bit. When Noah awoke from his wine and found out what his youngest son, Ham, had done to him, he said, Cursed be Canaan, the lowest of slaves will he be to his brothers. What I find interesting about this is, why does he curse Canaan? Ham was the one that did it. That's very odd. And the Jews recognized this, and they thought, the scriptures are trying to point us to something different here. Why would you curse a son that's probably not even born, and if he is born, still why would you curse your son rather than your, the guy that did the, the sin? Notice as well what he had done to him. Because of this, some people think that what went on here is that Ham is the first homosexual behavior that we see in Scripture. He went into his father's tent. Now, I'm going to back up here again, get back to where I was. Notice that it says, Ham, the father of Canaan, saw his father's nakedness there in verse 22. That word saw in the Hebrew implies a desire. Okay, it doesn't have to be a sexual desire, but some sort of desire. Not just noticing it, but gazing upon it. Wanting something. So some think that Ham raped his father because he wakes up and realizes what he had done to him. 
And being able to gaze upon would be maybe in a homosexual, lustful way. I used to kind of think that that was a possibility, but I do not line up necessarily with that interpretation. But that's one of them that's out there. Another interpretation is that he circumcised, or not really circumcised, castrated Noah. I'm not going to get into too many details here. I'm not going to line up with this one as well, but this is probably the number one reason or explanation among Jewish Midrash and their writings on this topic. Without giving all of the support for it, the bottom line is that they say that in Genesis there are four rivers that are mentioned coming out of the Garden of Eden. And there are, those are, rivers are often a, a picture of fertility in like your children. And that here they'll say that Noah, it says Ham, Shem, and Japheth, there's only three, there was a missing river. And that Canaan was supposed to be that river. And so what they believe is that they cut off Noah's ability to have more children. And this is why then he says, well, if you cut off my ability to have children, I'm going to curse your children. Okay? That's a second possible interpretation. Again, not one that I'm going to line up with. But that is the Hebrew Midrash of what was going on here. It's interesting that Noah is the only other person other than God that is going to use this word curse. So whatever happened here was very, very serious. Now, what was the result of the, or the reason for the first curse? It was because man wanted to be like God. Man wanted to have authority, dominion. God said, I gave you all dominion and authority, but Satan says, ah, but you see, you're going to be like God, knowing both good and evil. You're going to have all dominion and authority. And so ultimately, it was this, as we talked about when we went through the fall, a desire of what you could have, the boasting of what he has, the pride of life, was what a big part of the reason the curse came about, right? Uh, one other thing, I guess, some people say that he, he was just making fun of his father's nakedness, not treating him with respect. Noticed, you know, hey, look at that, you know, look at my dad, and, and the, the other boys had nothing to do with it. Okay, possibility, but I think there's more to it than that. Why would you curse, bring out such a serious thing over that, right? Before I give you the explanation that I am lining up with, Shem, Ham, or Shem and Japheth, uh, I think I mentioned this before. If not, we'll be, we're going to be, it'll be later on. We're going to see it in another example. The text in Hebrew literally says, he took and they covered, when it's speaking of Shem and Japheth. But Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it across their shoulders. Okay? It literally reads, he, one of them, took. Now, when we see this in Scripture, what it's doing is it's giving the act of benevolence that maybe one person thought of it, but the other person is of the same mind. So that you're like one in mind in doing it. All right? I, I just want to point that out because we are going to see that later as well. But anyway, the first person mentioned is said to get the credit for the thought of benevolence. And so Shem being that first person. Like I said, once again, here it even mentions that Ham is the father of Canaan, the future Canaanites. Stating this fact again shows Cain's changing attitude, I think, towards God. That Canaan became a wicked nation because their father, Ham. And it's making a connection there, showing that as a wicked example. I want to show you Leviticus 20, verse 19. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your mother's sister, nor of your father's sister, for that would uncover his near of kin. 
they shall bear their guilt. If a man lies with his uncle's wife, he has uncovered his uncle's nakedness. They shall bear their sin. They shall die childless. Isn't it interesting? To uncover one's nakedness is an idiom that is used time and time and time and time again in Scripture as having sex with. To uncover your father's nakedness wasn't to see your father exposed using the biblical idiom that we see throughout the scriptures. It's an idiom saying your father's nakedness would be either his wife or a concubine of your father or something like that. Notice verse 20. If a man lies with his uncle's wife, his uncle's wife being naked and and having sexual relations with them is uncovering your uncle's nakedness. What was the consequence? Childless. Or the child ultimately gets the punishment, you might say. Leviticus 18.7 does much the same. You must not expose your father's nakedness. Does that mean lifting up his robe? No. By having sexual relations with your mother. She is your mother. You must not have sexual relations with her. You must not have sexual relations with your father's wife. She is your father's nakedness. You see where I'm going with this. I think what Ham did was slept with his mother. And you go, wow, what, why? Oh. We'll come back to the why. Genesis 9.20 It continued, it says, Noah, man of the soil, proceeded to plant a vineyard. When he drank some of its wine, he became drunk and lay uncovered in his tent. So it just seems like that doesn't fit the context. Noah's the one that's drunk. Noah's the one, it's his tent. However, maybe because Noah was drunk, he had nothing. It's like, dad's not going to know. Dad's not going to be able to, to, uh, you know, stop us. And it's interesting that it says uncovered inside his tent. I put the Hebrew of that word up there. The Hebrew for tent is ochel. In the masculine, it's ochel, like his tent. It's not his tent in the Hebrew. Go look it up. It's ochela in the feminine form. It literally reads her tent in this text. Genesis 24, 67, we see a similar thing there. And Isaac brought her into his mother, Sarah's tent. Sarah's dead. Okay? So, Sarah doesn't have a tent. But it's her tent that Isaac is bringing Rebecca into here. So, some similar language there, linguistic usage. Verse 24, when Noah awoke from his wine, found out what his youngest son had done to him. Seems like it's a personal attack. Well, sleeping with your mother would also be something that you did to him. You sleep with my wife, you've done something to me. He said, cursed be Cain and the lowest of slaves will he be to his brothers. So it's interesting, what is the curse? To be a steward or a slave. To be submitted under others. Like I said before, why is Noah mad at his grandson rather than Ham? Well, I think that he slept with his mother because of the same reason we see the curse happening in Genesis, the pride of life. Wanting power and dominion. I didn't put these verses up here, but you can look at them later. I'll read them to you. 2 Samuel 12.8 says, David took Saul's concubines here. Remember when David uh, is being chased out of Jerusalem? What does Adonijah do first? Or not Adonijah. Um, what's his name? Uh, was it Absalom there? I know Absalom's in 2 Samuel 16. 
Uh, what's the other son? A, a, not Adon, Adonijah? Okay, anyway. In this text, you can go look in 2 Samuel 12, 8. He says, I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your keeping and gave you the house of Israel and Judah. If that had not been enough or if that had been too little, I also would have given you much more. Ultimately, by giving, God said, I gave you your master's wives. Now, not for David to sleep with them, but even in taking them in, it was giving David the authority of Saul. It's almost like being under the, you know, where Saul had some sort of authority in the eyes of the people by David having those wives, Saul's wives, it gave him the authority. The same thing happened with Absalom, with David's concubines in 2 Samuel 16, verses 20 through 23. Absalom was trying to usurp David's authority. And so as soon as David left town, he takes his concubines and sleeps with David's concubines up where everybody could see in, in, you know, in a tent, but just so that they knew. I'm king. I have the mantle now. I'm in charge. So by sleeping with um, Noah's mother, Noah's wife, I mean, by sleeping with Noah's wife, Cain would, or Ham would be saying, I'm taking over. My father, he's getting old. He doesn't know what he's doing. We need a leader and I'm going to take charge. And he goes and sleeps with his mother. He goes out and tells Japheth and, and Shem, hey, I slept. I'm the guy in charge. The mantle belongs to me now. You guys are going to follow me. And they don't agree. And they go and they cover their mother up. Noah wakes up, finds out what Ham had done to him. And he's saying, oh no, I'm in charge and your children aren't going to rule, they will be ruled over. And the possibility, I don't know what's what, if Canaan had already been born, but I don't think so. I think this is prophetic and that it is quite possible that the child born was Ham's child, not Noah's. Shem and Japheth said, this is what Ham did. And the mother probably was raped. And he wouldn't care. The, the whole point is, yeah, I want everybody to know. I want you just like uh, Absalom wanted everybody to know. I'm doing this because this is taking power. It's taking away your power and authority. And that's what I find interesting is that the word curse is used here only here and in Genesis. And the same reason for authority, usurping the authority. That word slave here can also be translated as steward. From what we know of Canaan's history, he and his descendants are never going to be completely enslaved by either of the brothers or their descendants suggesting that steward is a better translation than a slave. Okay. The descendants of Ham, however, do appear to be the Egyptians, the Sumerians, the Chinese, the Japanese, the Phoenicians, the Hittites, the Canaanites, and the American Indians. All of these people have always been interested in the physical world. More yielding you know, man-made inventions, they were warriors, they were laborers, they invent all kinds of things. Now the Japhethites and the Semites, they are more interested in the spiritual things. Not always good. Okay, Shem becomes the, the basically Jews, the uh, Europeans, but we see Japheth, uh, Shem, I'm sorry, is the Jews and, and Muslims. Japheth is the Europeans. The Muslims are very religious. Okay, Wrong religion, but they're very religious. They're not physically motivated as much as spiritually motivated, you would say. 
But anyway, um, we're going to see that the, the descendants of Japheth and Shem do take over and develop um, more things and, and become kind of more to where these other people are stewards for them, you might say. The, the Hamites become stewards in that way. So here are some of the parallels between Adam and Noah. Just, again, these onion layers. Both Adam and Noah were commanded to fill the earth and have authority over it. Both were ancestors of all men. Both sinned by eating the fruit of the fruit. Both became naked as a result of their sin. Both were covered by someone else. Both received curses which affected all of mankind. Both receive a blessing that affects all of mankind. In Shem's case, the, the prophecy of, of a coming Messiah. Also, Noah awakes and says, What have you done? God asks Adam and Eve the same question after they sinned, before the curse is given. What have you done? And so, the very way that these things are worded in this entire story of the flood account is taking you back to the creation. Closing up verse 26 to the end, he also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem. May Canaan be the slave of Shem. May God extend the territory of Japheth. May Japheth live in the tents of Shem. And may Canaan be his slave. After the flood, Noah lived 350 years. Altogether, Noah lived 950 years, then he died. So, along with the curse of Ham become the blessing, or comes the blessing for these two other brothers. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem. It's going to be through the line of Shem, like I said, that Jesus Christ, the Messiah, Yeshua, comes. The apparent descendants, as I said, of Shem are the Jews and the Muslims with that theological focus, whereas Ham has a physical focus. As for Japheth, it says he was to be enlarged. That word extend might be allude to the physical land size. But it could also mean an intellectual extension. From him are going to come the Greeks, the Romans, the Europeans, and the American peoples for the most part. They're going to have a focus on science and philosophy. As far as Noah living 350 years after the flood, we're going to see this greatly decrease from here on out. The lifespan of people changes immediately. Why? Some will say just because of DNA corruption, you know, but it is so fast right after the flood. I tend to think that it, there was more. I still like that canopy idea. And uh, that just means that the radiation of the sun is going to cause DNA mutations to happen much faster as well. As far as the tents of Shem, this is also important. Japheth will live in the tents of Shem. The Hebrews talk about the, tents of, the tent of Shem all the time. It is believed that after the flood, Shem is the one that taught the word of God to all these other patriarchs. And if you wanted to get knowledge or know more about God, you went and studied in the house of Shem. And so Hebrew writings are filled with this. So it's kind of interesting that it says this, Japheth lived in the tents of Shem. Uh, we're going to see later that Jacob and Esau. Jacob uh, was a man of, uh, he, he, we always called him a mama's boy, but it said that he lived in the, in the tents. He was a homeboy, but not, I, that's how it's often interpreted, but what I think is, <laughs> yeah, you get it. You got to say it right, boy. Yeah, homeboy. <laughs> but the bottom line is, it was more probably meaning that he had a heart for God, because when we see this in Scripture, it has a spiritual connotation of wanting to learn about God and be close and have a relationship with the Lord. And so Japheth, living in the tents of Shem, is, could really almost mean like living under the tutelage or teachings of Shem, the line that's going to teach people about God. Melchizedek or the king of Salem? Some think that Shem was Melchizedek. I don't think so. No, we'll talk about that another time. That's too long of an explanation. But I, I think Empire. that uh, one of the reasons that may have happened is to keep people from seeing Jesus as the Messiah. What do we take away from this in closing? For me, it was this. <laughs> Authority. 
I think that just as it was the curse in the garden, and really what caused Ham to be cursed wasn't the action, it was the desire and what was in his heart to make him do those actions. And ultimately, I think that we aren't any better in when we want to take control of our life each and every day. When we say, God, no, I don't want to, I'm not going to trust you and let you be in charge. I want to be in charge. And that attitude that we have in our heart to want to control everything and not surrender all to Jesus, that is worthy of the curse. A curse of curses. That is how serious God sees that independent living. And so, examine yourself in where we are being independent in our lives and saying, no, I, God, I got this. I don't need you, or maybe I don't even want you in this part of my life. I, I'd love to have you there on Sunday and when I'm in trouble, but otherwise, when I'm rolling in the dough and I've got this you know, attitude about it or whatever, I just, don't worry, I got this. Whatever the case might be. You guys will just take that to the Lord in prayer and let the Lord reveal in your heart where you might have an attitude of ham inside you. All right? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank You for Your Word and uh, thank You for the, the covenant that belongs to us, those promises. Thank You that You are not only just the, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but the God of Israel. And that means the God of us. And Lord, we want to submit to Your rules. We want to submit to Your authority. Submit to Your dominion. And we just want to let You be the one that leads in our life. So show us, Lord, where we're trying to take control and let us just let go. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.